Welcome to part two of my video series revisiting the classic television show, Reboot. If you haven't yet, I would recommend checking out part one first, because a lot of the groundwork for the series is laid out in that video. So, despite numerous hurdles caused by network censorship and the growing pains of new animation technology, Reboot's first season turned out to be a big hit, garnering fans young and old all across North America and the UK. I'm really amazed by the computer animation by it, you know, a lot of work has been in, is involved in it, obviously and um, just impressed by it, you know? I like the show Reboot because there's all these like square things, like there's all these different robots, they're like... Reboot Season 2 premiered August 31st, 1995 in Canada and about a month later in the United States. It would mark a turning point in the series, and while changes to the show in this second season wouldn't be as drastic or far-reaching as those to be seen in Season 3, you can definitely see the beginnings of a shift here. First of all, now that Mainframe Entertainment's creative team had grown more familiar with CGI animation, more time and effort could be put into the writing process, which was now being done in-house in Vancouver rather than being mostly outsourced as it was was in the first season. The first season we, we used a bunch of uh, established writers from LA and that's mostly because uh, we, we were kind of too busy just trying to get the shows done. We were under the gun constantly. The first few episodes of season two feel similar to the happy-go-lucky, episodic tone of the first season that could be seen in most Saturday morning cartoons and sitcoms up till then. It's like the same sh just happens over and over, and then in a week it just all resets until it happens again. Though starting with the fifth episode, Painted Windows, Reboot's second season began to develop an overarching story, where before each episode had a self-contained plot, now the events of every episode would carry over from and build upon those of the previous one to create a longer, more complex narrative. This trend would become even more pronounced in each successive season, to the point where by its fourth season, Reboot could be more accurately described as a long longer story broken up into smaller chapters than as shorter stories combined to form a longer one. Season 2's multi-episode story arc kicks off when Mike the TV accidentally breaks a portal to the web, belonging to Hexadecimal. This releases a web creature, a sort of digital eldritch abomination, into mainframe. The web creature causes a myriad of problems for our heroes over the next several episodes, culminating in the season finale, which features an alliance of the mainframers and the viruses to prevent an all-out invasion by more of these web creatures. We need their help to save Mainframe. The hardware is nearly complete, but we need the software to run it. That episode ends with Megabyte betraying Bob and launching him into the web just before the portal closes, concluding Season 2 on a cliffhanger and irreparably changing Reboot's status quo for the remainder of the series. It was just a matter of knowing the secret of all TV shows. At the end of the episode, everything's always right back to normal. This cliffhanger forces the viewer to think about Bob and his role in the show up till this point. He has, until now, pretty much indisputably been the hero, while other characters like Dot, Enzo, Frisket, and Fong got moments to shine and were often instrumental in saving the day, it was usually Bob who actually had to get down into it and do most of the day-saving legwork. His resourcefulness and experience had always been a big help in a pinch, while his charisma and affable personality clearly did a lot for the city of Mainframe's morale. It's mentioned several times throughout the series that Mainframe was not exactly a safe place to be before Bob showed up. We lost many dear friends before Bob came to Mainframe and helped us defeat the user. While he may not have always had everything under control, and he actually comes off as rather goofy a lot of the time, Stay frosty. When we wrote it in the script, Bob the hero was being cool. When Michael delivered it, he was kind of cheesy with it. And we went, no, that works. Because he's trying to reassure everybody. And everybody knows he's trying to reassure them. So they all kind of look at him sideways and go, yeah, right, okay, Bob. But they love him for it. Bob's just that sort of person who everyone else can depend on when all else fails. And his being ejected out of mainframe feels a bit like removing the training wheels for the rest of the cast. His loss is a hole that never really gets filled again, even when the character eventually does return later on in the series. So much for me being Mr. Save the Day. 
The topic of Bob and his temporary removal from the series is actually one of the thematic through lines for season 3, so I'll get into it a lot more in that video. Reboot's second season prepares in advance for Bob's departure though, by buffing out the core cast a little bit before he leaves. We wouldn't want the series to be left with only two main characters. The hacker, Mouse, a guest star from the season 1 episode, The Great Brain Robbery, returns to mainframe and is promoted to a main cast member in the last few episodes of season 2. Additionally, a new supporting character named Andrea is introduced to be a foil for Enzo, who up till now had been the only child character on the show. Andrea is a game sprite, a program who is only meant to exist within a specific game that leaves when the game does, whether or not the user wins. She bonds with Enzo over the course of a game, since they're both children and neither has ever really had any companionship in their age range. There's actually a touching little detail in this episode that I never noticed before this watch through. At the climax of the game, Andrea says, Goodbye, my friend. And forlornly watches as Enzo is about to win the game. It seems at first like this line is a red herring, since it's revealed momentarily that Andrea was actually able to leave the game by attaching herself to Enzo's icon. Only, if you listen carefully to the dialogue, that's not really what happens. I downloaded a backup of myself onto your icon! The game let me out thinking I was you! You can do that? Andrea wasn't able to leave the game. The Andrea that met and befriended Enzo throughout this episode actually stayed inside the game and never saw him again. It was a copy of her that returned with Enzo so that he and another version of her could be happy finally having a friend their own age. Damn, that's... Actually, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of that one movie, The Pres... The returning characters from Season 1 also get a lot more definition this time around. I particularly like everything done with Hexadecimal in Season 2. While the first season introduced her briefly as a spontaneous, childlike character defined by a love of chaos, there was only really one episode that featured her prominently, while Season 2 devotes several episodes to exploring more of who she really is underneath her various masks. She's a really fascinating character, and I honestly can't think of any other quite like her, especially from a children's show. Hex is voiced excellently by stage actress Shirley Milner, who alternates seamlessly between sounding sweet or funny to loud and furious to downright chilling. I have spread through systems, peoples, and cities from this place, mainframe, my format, virus, the queen of <laughs> My point here is that Season 2 is where Reboot's writing begins to shine. The characters start to get better developed, the stakes are a lot higher without it feeling forced, and the world building begins to feel a lot more fleshed out. Concepts such as the web, guardian protocol and hierarchy, game sprites, and even Mainframe's destroyed sister city and Dot and Enzo's father are all introduced and briefly touched upon here in Season 2, though these ideas wouldn't really be explored until later on in the series. The show also begins to gradually become darker in tone as Season 2 progresses, owing to some drama behind the scenes. You see, early on in the production of this season, the ABC network, which up till that point had been the broadcast network for the show in the United States, was purchased by the Disney Company, who, wanting to focus more on their own projects, were uninterested in Reboot as a property. Showrunners Gavin Blair and Ian Pierce Pearson decided that since this meant Reboot was likely facing imminent cancellation, it didn't ultimately matter too much how strictly they adhered to the strenuous censorship demands that the ABC network had been imposing on them. This also led to, of course, more light-hearted jabs at ABC's expense. It's the ABCs! They've turned on us! Treacherous dogs! As well as a more concerted effort by Reboot staff to push the envelope. Apparently, the episode Bad Bob was at first completely rejected by the network only to be resubmitted by Mainframe Entertainment with no changes and then approved. We also had some actually dangerous weapons begin to show up in Season 2, as well as a few occasions where characters were even allowed to be injured. There were still a few instances of stuff like this, though. Oh, Brisket! <laughs> Brisket's alright. He's just drained and weak. He'll be fine. <laughs> I can see their parachutes! They're okay. Season 2 also contains the first and only instance in Reboot of a character using mild profanity on screen. Damn you! 
the characters in a children's cartoon series are swearing. Oh sh! What are we gonna do now? Following Reboot's cancellation on ABC, reruns of the first two seasons began syndication in the United States, while it continued to air on YTV in Canada. The show would ultimately be picked up by Cartoon Network in the US on its third season. However, there was a brief period of time where it was uncertain whether or not Reboot would even get a third season, which would have made season two's cliffhanger all the more frustrating. Thank God that didn't happen, though. Prepare yourselves for the hunt. Ahem. <clears throat> I actually saw this cliffhanger when it first aired on TV, and I remember being very distressed the next week when it looped back to the first episode of season one. This led to my mother having to explain to me how television seasons worked, assuring me in my panicked state that the show would return with new episodes the following year, and that Bob would probably be fine. Little did either of us know that this very nearly didn't happen at all. It was also during season two that the show began to lean far more heavily into pop culture references. I noticed so many throughout the season that if I were to list all of them here, this would be a very long and meandering video. But here's just a few of them. These two booted into the game and tried to win it by setting off an explosion capable of destroying a planet! Bad idea. Yes, especially when you're inside the planet! Why'd you do it? Had to, mister. And all he did was keep saying, make it so. And engage. I said engage more times than make it so. Leave a comment down below letting me know your favorite pop culture reference from the second season. One notable difference in season two compared to its first in regards to its referential humor is that several entire episodes are devoted to paying homage to other franchises and genres. This trend would also continue on and be pushed even further during seasons three and four. For example, season two's ninth episode, Trust No One, is a deliberate riff on The X-Files, a popular television show at the time, and features two binomes working for the... CGI, named agents Modem and Nully. Nully also just happens to be voiced by Gillian Anderson, who played Agent Scully on The X-Files, and who was married to one of Reboot's production designers at the time. Episode 7, Nullzilla, is a parody of different types of Japanese media, such as tokusatsu kaiju and giant combining mech shows like Voltron in general, but most specifically seems to be aping Power Rangers, which was enormously popular in the United States at the time. You're kidding, right? These form a what? A giant robot. This is my favorite episode of the season. You can really tell that the writers and actors were all having a blast parodying the Sentai subgenre, which really comes through in the finished product. I also love all these little moments, like the characters not knowing how to combine their individual robots into the mech suit. Fong, this is ridiculous. We're never gonna get a robot out of these. They don't even fit together. Not knowing how to use their weapons. Use the disruptomatic. What disruptomatic? Fong, we haven't got a disruptomatic. Or just Bob's exasperation with the whole ordeal. Okay, let's do it. Black Beetle Turbo Pincer Force. I also love the look of the mech suit, which, while obviously intended to be a riff on Power Rangers Megazord conceptually, seems to me to be more inspired in its design and color scheme by the Gundam series. Sadly, these cliché Sentai tropes that were played for laughs by Reboot back in 1995 would go on over 20 years later to be played absolutely straight to disastrous results in the show's uninspired hackneyed 2018 spin-off Reboot the Guardian Code. <laughs> You can't talk in these things. Then there's Mad Max. Oh boy, is there Mad Max. Reboot Season 2's fourth episode, Bad Bob, is clearly inspired by the Mad Max film series, specifically the Road Warrior. Just walk away. Just walk away. This episode was created around a piece of concept art made seemingly on a whim by Reboot's lead designer, Brendan McCarthy. One of the things he brought us was uh, he drew Megabyte as a truck. He just gave it to us in a pile of designs for other stuff that we'd asked for. And we looked at it and said, Brendan, what the hell is this? Like, it's Megabyte's a truck, it's cool, isn't it? And we're like, well, yeah, it is, but what's it for? He's like, oh, I don't know, I just had this idea. We then roped in a whole bunch of Mad Maxi 
style ideas where Bob was Mad Max and his car was Mad Max's car and Fong was in a gyrocopter and things like this and that all just came out of Brendan's head and that was that was what you got with Brendan. The episode is centered around an extended chase inside of a game with our heroes chasing after a truck equipped with a massive energy source down a long single road. At some point after Bad Bob was aired, Brendan McCarthy would meet and befriend the actual creator of Mad Max, George Miller. The two of them later began work in 2003 writing the story for what would eventually become the hit 2015 film Mad Max Fury Road, a movie centered around an extended chase following after a truck equipped with a massive energy source down a long single road. No, I'm not kidding, this 1995 episode of Reboot paying homage to Mad Max would go on to inspire an actual Mad Max film 20 years after the fact that was also co-written by the guy most responsible for that episode of Reboot being made in the first place. I should also point out that Fury Road is itself a reboot of the Mad Max film franchise. That was what you got with Brendan. He just He'd always give you more than you asked for. It was always brilliant. It was always insane, but it was always brilliant. Reboot's second season was, in many ways, a more polished, more refined version of what you could tell the show was going for the first time around. We could actually look around and, and take charge of some of the more creative aspects of the show and bring them more in line with what we wanted to do. It was here that the show really began to step up and become something truly noteworthy for reasons other than the technology behind it. Next time, we're going to take a look at... Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I feel like I'm forgetting something important in regards to the second season of Reboot. How could I have forgotten? With Reboot having successfully proven that CGI was a viable animation technique for television, plans were soon set in motion for the second all-CGI cartoon series, Beast Wars, a spin-off of the popular 80s cartoon, The Transformers. This is all relevant here because a lot of Reboot Season 2 seems to have been prototyping many of the assets that would be used next year on Season 1 of Beast Wars, especially the third episode, When Games Collide. I mean, just look at the opening musical sting from that episode. Now compare it to the musical sting from this Season 1 episode of Beast Wars. Both series were scored by composer Robert Buckley, produced by Mainframe Entertainment, and even starred many of the same voice actors. When Games Collide also seems to be the origin of a lot of Beast Wars style and visual cues. Much of the episode is set inside of games featuring plant life, rocks, ruins, and general scenery that resemble the bulk of the sets near the beginning of Beast Wars. Hell, even this Mecha T-Rex looks like something of a prototype for Megatron. Just look at those legs. Come on, t tell me those aren't transmetal legs. So, next time, instead of jumping straight into Reboot Season 3, we're going to switch gears a bit and take a look at Mainframe Entertainment's next project after Reboot Season 2, Season 1 of another of my favorite childhood cartoons, Beast Wars. Thanks for watching. Drop a comment down below letting me know what you thought of Reboot Season 2. YouTube is now putting more and more emphasis on likes, so if you could do me a big favor and hit that like button on your way out and subscribe if you're new, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks very much again for watching, and take care. T. Earl Grey. What in the net is T. Earl Grey? Oh!